wouldn't have been able to put this together. Uh, going back to the 1971, which was my, uh, well before even that, I knew a little about Manhattan Beach because my dad was a marine engineer and he had brought a tanker into a couple of times into San Pedro and I drove from our home just south of Santa Monica Airport down to San Pedro. It took two to two and a half hours on the highway, as everybody used to call PCH, before freeways. And people, even when I moved here in 52, people said, no freeways? How did you get anywhere? Well, there's probably one-fifth of the people. It made a whole lot of difference. But at any rate, um, 1971, my eldest child was at Wadoli High School. And he wanted to go to El Porto, as many of his friends were doing. But he wasn't old enough to drive yet. So we drove down, and I looked at this, and I thought, well, you could live at the beach. My husband's from Santa Monica. I'd only seen cliffs, Santa Monica, Pacific Palisades. Venice was not exactly a desirable place to live with family. And, well, you could live here. The kids could walk to school. This was a very important issue for us at the time because by then we lived in Ladera Heights. I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's county territory and the Inglewood School District. And the politicians at the time came up with a Marby scheme to pair all the schools and bust the kids off. And it's not really a much bigger town than Manhattan Beach. But uh, people weren't real happy with that and the exodus just was instant. And it, soon there was, you know, I figured, I still have four more kids to send to school. Where are we going to do this? I'm thinking, wow, I'm also driving three carpools. This looks pretty good. Kids can walk to school. They can walk to the library. They can walk to the Lamar Theater. Hmm. So I began investigating. And I dropped, the youngest one was about three, three and a half at the time. I dropped the other kids wherever they were at school. And we came down to the beach till it was time for kindergarten to go over and head to head back. And she'd play on the swings at uh, Marine Street, or we'd ride up and down the strand on my bicycle, and I'd talk to various people along the way. I didn't want to get out of the frying pan into the fire. So, you know, what was it like here? Uh, what were the schools like? What, how was the lifestyle of everything going? One lady ended up living up the street from where she was. She, I don't know, I've been here since 1929. Works okay for me. Okay, sounded good. So anyway, after we finally made this decision, after we've driven, I don't know, did you do all the pictures yet? I didn't do my tours of Manhattan Beach. Because after we were doing that, then I started driving up and down, I think, every street in this town to see where everything was, what was here, what was there. And uh, well, I'm thinking, this looks pretty good. And uh, anyway, when we... Uh, decided we were going to move here. We did look at Hermosa too, but Manhattan's a more family-friendly town, we thought. At any rate, uh, we wanted to live at the beach. If we're going to live at the beach, we want to live at the beach, so our family of seven could walk down to the beach and not drive down. I could have done that where I was before, except the schools we didn't have. But at any rate, after I began exploring, and so we ended up finding, couldn't find anything that would suit a family of seven. The realtors kept trying to get me inland because they got bigger houses. So anyway, we built a house on 17th Street in the 200 block, uh, 18th Street, excuse me, I don't even know where I live. Uh, and also, while I was doing some of my explorations, I, I I, there was a gas station between 14th and 15th on Highland. And I'm looking across and here's a berm and I can't remember now if the letters were in flowers or what, but it said Manhattan Beach. And I thought, well, that's funny looking. Then I found out there used to be the city hall there that they tore down in 71 after the earthquake. But the new city hall wasn't built yet. The gas station isn't there anymore either. But at any rate, when we uh, uh, decided to build there on, uh, on 18th Street, the uh, city also decided they were going to tear up the Walk Street because they were looking for, I think it was gas lines, and they started on one side of the street, didn't find them there, kept working until the whole thing was gone. So then, I don't know if you're familiar with 18th Street west of Highland, but it curves. Mm -hmm. Other streets are straight. But they decided they'd get very artsy and they moved the uh, light post over to the north side of the street so that emergency vehicles could get down there. Well, I've never seen one in 44 years. They know they're not supposed to drive on the street, but 
Anyway, it made our street very unique. But our home was finished, we moved in in uh, August, August 24th actually, of 1972. But the street still wasn't completed. They didn't complete that until the end of October. In fact, the city sent a notice telling us that the paving was going to be done on October 31st. And I thought, that didn't sound like a good idea to me. <laughs> I presume the contract said they had to be done by the end of the month, but anyway, I called City Hall and I said, you do know that's Halloween? <laughs> yes. I said, well, I could just see every kid within miles around putting their hand and feet print in that whole street. <laughs> so they did send a truck top and bottom to block the street so the kids couldn't go down there, so that, that got uh, done anyway, and we had no hand or footprints. But then, uh, when that was finished, then we began uh, landscaping. And as you know, way back, we had lots of scrub and ice plant and sand. And my husband happened to be in the wholesale flower ball business. So we planted, you know, we only got, what, 20 by 24 or something out there in front. But he planted, you know, bushes and shrubs and hundreds of flower balls. And people were absolutely stunned. They didn't know that anything grew at the beach. And he put some fertilizer in that sand. It works pretty well, <laughs> and some mulch. But at any rate, he, uh, he gave away uh, thousands of bulbs to neighbors and whatever, and pretty soon things are being landscaped. But uh, actually, it was only when I started looking for this, I came across this. This was the program of the Manhattan Beach Chamber of Commerce Awards Dinner, March 28, 1974. And we received the Residential Beautification Award that year. Mm. Uh, the, that award didn't last a whole lot of years because pretty soon everybody started landscaping. It just became a thing to do and once they found out you could grow things, even in the sand, <laughs> that uh, went to pass. Anyway, uh, after that then I guess uh, the next thing that I had in mind was my kids joined the Junior Lifeguards, which I thought was incredible. Uh, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm a rotten swimmer. I mean, I could never save anybody. I could get across the pool, but that would be about it. But the ocean, no. So I told my kids, you got to go here. I, I should tell you that my older kids, I told you I had the one in, in, in Loyola. The next child, uh, when we moved here, started Maricosta. And then I had a six-year gap, so I had the three younger ones. And all the three younger ones went to junior lifeguards. That was an absolute must. But Steve had told me, Steve Meisen older, if you don't know Steve, uh, had told me that the junior lifeguards existed a long time ago. And I thought they were quite new at the time. Maybe they had not been active and then got active again. I don't know. And she got that picture. Those were not my kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wild guy. But anyway, the program was really, we thought, just fabulous. And it grew and it grew. And it was free at the time, and uh, then the lifeguards, they were going to discontinue it because they said it had gotten so expensive that it was too much to, for them to carry. So we said, oh, no, you know, well, how much would you need? So they came up with $50 per person, and I, I think, if uh, anybody has a child more recent, I think it's $450 to $500 now. Still well worth it in that six-week program. And my grandson also is a graduate of all that, and he has saved many people himself out in the ocean. And he taught uh, some of the summer camp programs, and he said, you know, kids are caught out behind the waves, and he's going back in, and parents who didn't even know that the kid was in trouble. So I just think, you know, it's, the most, it's an absolutely valuable program. So we've got to keep that one going. Anyway, um, then I guess it was around that time that I joined the historical historical, <laughs> hysterical committee. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know how I knew about it. It must have been something in the paper, but I thought, well, that sounds real interesting because I had thought, just from what I knew, this town in the early days, the 30s and 40s, looked so much like Taft, Oregon, where my aunt and uncle lived when I was a kid. And we had to go back to the beach. And particularly the downtown business block, which is where I believe the Manhattan market is still today. But it had a hardware store in the market, and in those days, you uh, you had a cage in, in the market, and literally it looked like you know doggy training cages, except adult adult size, 
and you didn't have post office boxes, you went there and you got your mail from Lucy, Betty, John, whomever it was that was the clerk of it there. And they knew you and you know, obviously a small town, huh? So I just thought, gee, this this is so much like the market that my uncle owned in South Oregon and his wife was the postmistress in the cage in the back of the market. Now, everything must have developed at the same time about the same way. And at any rate, the uh, um, uh, historical, I keep saying historical, historical committee, uh, the, the city gave us, or allowed us to use a room in the then new post office building on 15th and, and Valley, where uh, the post office and the Chamber of Commerce is, and used to be the old library before they built the new library. And that was really super. Now we had a place to display the artifacts or do whatever. And at that time, this was not a, a tourist town. In fact, when we moved here, my mother-in-law said, you're moving where? She just thought it was the end of the world. And even then, people would say to me, where's Manhattan Beach? Now they say, oh, you live in Manhattan Beach? <laughs> Good choice way back then. But at any rate, uh, there was no place in this town to buy anything that said Manhattan Beach on it. There were no postcards, there were no t-shirts, there were none of those things. And so we're in the, right there by the post office, which probably got more traffic than it is now when we go to things like Boston, but people would come in and buy postcards and, and the photographs and the whatever. The city gave us a stipend of a little over $300 per year. And so we sold the pictures and the postcards and whatnot to raise money to do other things, like uh, publishing these monographs, these single subject old buffets. And there's the fire department, this one happens to be the Neptunian Club, there's one that's the capsule history of Manhattan Beach, long before we got bigger, fancier books. But it cost us about $1,000 to print, I think about 1000 of these. But uh, anyway, selling these pictures and postcards allowed us the funds to to do that. And I met some just wonderful people through that, uh, in that era. Wilmer Drake, Pat Cunningham, sorry Pat's not here today, but um, Wilmer told wonderful stories about the, his early days. One of them being how the, they filmed on the sand dunes at El Segundo and they would lay planks of wood there so they'd ride the dollies carrying the cameras up on the dunes and the kids would go haul home all the wood that they had left behind to use the firewood. Some years after that, after the TV on, there's an old Rudolph Valentino movie, uh, well, black and white, of course, and they're trudging across the desert. I looked at that, started laughing, and I called my husband and I said, Look, what do you see that looks kind of funny there? Nothing. Look at a ice plant. Ice plant in the ruins in the Sahara. <laughs> At that time, I mean, people were not sophisticated enough to know that, nor had they traveled enough or even thought about it. I probably would have noticed it if Wilmer hadn't mentioned that, and I just, I just, just chuckled ever since on that. These things you learn from history. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, many years later, uh, when some of the residents were planting those little gardens that there are a lot of now on the west side of the Strand, and people are complaining, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. And one man wrote to the local paper, they shouldn't be planting anything there except the native plants, like ice plant. <laughs> it wasn't native. It was actually the ladies of the Neptunian Club and many followed after who planted all that to hold down the sand because it's hard to believe now, but it was not desirable to live at the beach because when the sand blew, it was just piercing. It was you know cut through you like a knife. So they planted all that, and there's, there's pictures of the historical site has it just rows and rows and rows, and all those ladies crawling along on their hands and knees, planting all this stuff. Now we just think it's native. But <laughs> anyway, during the my volunteer hours there in the center, uh, and we were there a lot of I think Steve would ask me, and I don't remember if we I don't think we were open every weekday, but uh, several, but. Uh, one of the things that was really fun uh, in today's tech world, we got an answering machine for our telephone. 
where people could call up. They would find out one time when we were open, whatever. Uh, they could leave us messages. We could call back. I mean, what an invention. This is what, around the 80s? I don't remember exactly, but... Uh, <coughs> anyway, um, there were times, uh, too, where people would be downtown and people would say, well, where can I get an ice cream cone? There was no place to buy an ice cream cone or taffy or any of those things we associate with beach towns. I do remember Joe's Candy Cottage and now there are ice cream stores and whatever. But uh, anyway, as I said, I, I really enjoyed going through all of these uh, newspaper books. The committee then had bound them by year and they were just a weekly newspaper, but then that's when you had it every week, you got 52 pages. But I particularly enjoyed going through the early 50s because that's the time that we bought our first house in a track just south of the Santa Monica Airport. So it was just interesting to me to see what was going on here, heard of what was going on there. And uh, I particularly remember the, the Brown Ranch, which is now Hollywood Park and, and Manhattan Middle School. But that was a 30-acre working ranch. You know, they used to say there's no life east of Sepulveda, there wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> it was a lot of farmland, but he, uh, he was a judge in Hawthorne, and that Judge Benjamin Brown. And uh, they bought that land in 1943, and he passed away in 49. But uh, I, I was just particularly interested in Liberty Village because it was so much like the track that we grew up in, and of course that's adjacent to that land. But the, uh, I, I remember in those pictures, or seeing in those pictures, water must have been three, four feet high on the garage doors of the homes, which would be by the uh, Little League field north, north of the, the land. And of course, flooding continued and continued because the city allowed the drainage from the infrastructure at Liberty Village to drain into the Brown Ranch. Well, pretty soon, you know, if you had their pictures, old pictures of people water skiing on that. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much destroyed the ranch. And uh, at any rate, the, there was much, much, much difficulty with that and consternation of people. And it was a health hazard, and it was this, and it was that. And I say, Ms., uh, Mrs. Brown was then a widow. And uh, the school district decided that they would, the school board, I should say, decided that they would um, pursue eminent domain to condemn the property. They own eight, eight acres that I think uh, was, is the area where the school yard is now. It's Tech and uh, Manhattan Beach Boulevard. But anyway, uh, it was June 8, 56, and the school board resolved that the Brown Ranch be acquired for the purpose of constructing and maintaining school buildings and grounds and any public use authorized by law. Then on July 12th of 56, the district filed condemnation proceedings under eminent domain requiring the acquisition of the Brown Estate Ranch. The settlement reached was $60,000 for all of that land. I, I kind of liken it to the airport. You know, when it comes to the point where who else is going to buy it? You kind of have to except whatever the offer is. But uh, I'm not exactly sure the years when uh, I know they sold Manhattan Heights uh, and built houses there. And Robinson was closed, Ladera was closed. Uh, what, uh, what's the other one? Oh, La Marina. La Marina. La Marina. La Marina. La Marina. So then, uh, in what one prominent person at the time said, well, the prices are getting so high on these houses, families can't afford to move here anymore. They were probably running around 50 to 100,000 at the time. But uh, I guess that was a lot of money, but of course that didn't happen. But things were very slow for quite a while. We used to have the two junior highs, Center and Vague, and uh, my kids went to Grandview and Center and then Miracosta. But uh, they decided to combine that and build one uh, middle school. So there was much consternation going on about all of this. There were, one plan was to rebuild Vague and sell the property where La Marina was. 
to a developer who wanted to build condominiums. Well, the hue and cry went up. Now, especially the Liberty Village people, the, anybody that lived nearby is saying, condominiums, oh my God. Anyway, I went to this hearing, and everybody's going back and forth on this. And finally, I walked up to the microphone and I introduced myself, being from the Historical Society, and I said, you can't sell this land. This was condemned by eminent domain, and it can be used only for public purposes. Both sides, looking back and forth, and I thought, doesn't anybody do their homework? I mean, surely there must be other people in the city that know that. And all this fighting one, of course, as you know, a Manhattan Middle School is built where La Marina used to be, and uh, they opened, I believe, in 1998. But anyway, back to the 70s. Uh, you will all remember the beginnings of Prop 13 and all the talk about it and whatever. And uh, those of us on the historical committee rather felt that, many of us anyway, that tax money probably would not be used for the collection and preservation of historical items in the city. So we decided that we would uh, incorporate as a nonprofit 501c3 corporation in the state of California. Some of the people weren't happy because they wanted to be on the city committee, but at any rate, that allowed us to get tax-free money and to do more and more with the history of the city. So, uh, at any rate, in, uh, I think it was 1979, ground was broken for the Manhattan Village development, and there's a picture of me someplace with my foot on a shovel, and I must have been president of the Historical Society then, because I wouldn't have been there with all the dignitaries <laughs> were that not so. so. Uh, and that added something like eight, one-eighth of the population of the city to there. Then in 1984, plans began to refurbish the pier. A chunk of cement had fallen off of the pier and uh, paralyzed the jogger who was under there. And uh, the pier is actually owned by the state of California. But he, uh, this went on for quite a while. And one, some wanted to build a grandiose version. Um, others said it would be far too costly to re repair that pier, and it served no particular purpose. They want to tear it down. Well, it was really Chris Robinson. He came up there soon. Not Chris, excuse me. Uh, Keith. I just said Keith Robinson. Oh, here. This is really a Tedesco, a terrible picture of her, but she also was a past president. <laughs> I believe it was Keith that came up with the peer pressure, P-I-E-R, and designed the t-shirts and whatever, and so we set about, you know, a big move to, to do this. And you can see Keith's cartoons in the Easy Reader every week right now. He doesn't look like that anymore, but, <laughs> but he's, he's not pictured in his cartoons. So anyway, it took uh, quite some time to get that done. I think it was uh, 1992 when it was completed. And uh, that's how you see it's, it was torn down to the nibs and, and rebuilt. Actually, much more like it originally looked because I think it had a, uh, an asphalt tile top on it whenever they put the, the uh, tiles back. But every time I look at that, now every time I see the ABC uh, weather news, they use the Manhattan Pier at sunset as the background. And I think, every time I think of it, I think, Serve no particular purpose. Too <laughs> costly to repair. <laughs> it has become the icon that is Manhattan Beach. So uh, anyway, we say it's more and more of the beach homes were being torn down. Uh, a 1905 cottage on 15th Street, 205 15th Street actually, uh, became available and the city purchased it. And it is, aren't these beautiful? This is, uh, oh, that's Jackie May. Jackie, Jackie May, just beautiful stuff. And again, I'll give Steve credit for coming up with all of these. Isn't that too bad? Not worth keeping, huh? So, and so many times I've heard, oh, that'll never work. Oh, that won't be any good. Oh, there's no point in doing that. Who'll do that? Who'll move here? <laughs> Who'll move Manhattan Beach? The prices are so high. Lots of people. Uh, at any rate, uh, after the cottage became available, 
then the city purchased it for one dollar and uh, refurbished it and moved it to its present site in Bollywood Park. And I, really, I probably knew it one time, but I had forgotten until I was looking this up that the cottage belonged to Janet Schulte, one of the co-authors of our number two monograph, which I thought was about Janet uh, Elliot Schulte. Odd spelling, but anyway, I thought that's really neat that her her home is now the home of the historical society and is preserved in Pollywood Park. It just made the little red house ever so much more interesting to me. To, there's a real person that lived there, and you know whatever all all that went on there. I have several copies of the blurb on the little red house. If anybody wants it, I'll pass them out later. It's very interesting to see how that came about. Uh, at any rate, when it moved across town, I became a little less active. I'd been very active for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. I thought it was time for the folks on the east side of town to be doing something. So. But at any rate, I did keep up with things. And then there was uh, some kind of a, 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 an argument going on with factions of the historical society as to who owned what. And they had taken this case to the city council to decide the money of Solomon a little bit. But anyway, so I went there, and I knew people on both sides, and I think they're all well-meaning. But there again, they didn't know themselves that they were incorporated in the state of California. The city council had absolutely zero jurisdiction over what happened or what they did. But there was one city councilman who was really quite rude, <laughs> really challenged me. Well, you have a 501c3. I wasn't quite sure at the time, but I just said yes. And uh, so I think he was admit that they were powerless, they couldn't do anything. But then later, uh, the city uh, does have a contract with the historical society and they required ownership of the artifacts in order to take care of this. In a way, I thought that was really too bad because the incorporation papers say that the, everything goes to the city if the society no longer exists. And also, everything used to be just so simple. You know, they provided the space, we did our job, it was all very friendly, it wasn't legal, it wasn't anything. But I know maybe you know, all the things they have to do to maintain the house, that's a whole different story, and we have a much more litigious society. But anyway, again this year, uh, the school board or school district came up with these, what well, I thought, rather grandiose plans for Pollywood Park, and I thought, oh my God, here we go again. <laughs> uh, and I want to know, well, exactly what are the restrictions? What does the condemnation say? So I set out to research this, and I did uh, ultimately turn to, uh, oh, forgot her name now, shame on me. Karen uh, Rosenberg, what's her first name? Ellen Rosenberg. Ellen, thank Ellen. you. Uh, I wrote to, to her, and then she, with my concerns, and then she sent that to the uh, superintendent of schools, and then I went to the attorneys, and all this came back, but not still not really what I wanted to know. The most valuable thing of it all is the plot map that shows exactly what the parameters are from uh, what is now Peck Avenue to Redondo Avenue, north of Manhattan Beach to 18th Street. And that's parcels one and two, and then there's this tiny little place down at the bottom that's parcel three. But that belongs to the uh, LA County Flood Control District. That's Polywalk Pond itself, so that's dandy. But anyway, that clarified that for me. And then I thought, well, how am I going to find out exactly what all this says and whatever? And I thought, oh, Jen Dennis. Jen Dennis is, and here, what? I've written books for 30 years, she's been on the city council. She was mayor, and she very graciously invited me to her house so I could go through her um, uh, research. And she has spent thousands of hours down at the county courthouse and all this, and she's, um, her, her room is just stacked with verification of everything you can think of in this city. But at any rate, I found that the, uh, the term eminent domain reads the right of government or its agents to expro expropriate private property for public use for payment of compensation. That's all I wanted to know, that and what the map was. <laughs> what are the guidelines? So I'm, I'm hoping that this stays in the forefront of 
uh, everybody in the city, the city, city hall, city council, uh, the school board, the historical society, and in and this, uh, I shared, shared all this information with all the parties involved, and I got a really lovely note back from the uh, deputy superintendent, uh, Ms. Uh, Murakawa Leopard, which I really appreciate. It was really very nice. So I think we're, we now all know what the story is. And the Historical Society seems to be the, the present anyway, the only entity that really keeps track of all of this. And it's uh, newer people, either, I don't know, they just think it's there. I always wonder, what was here before? Where was this land? This is, you know, what happened here? But uh, anyway, I just think that the Historical Society is a very valuable entity and should be. Now, there's a few other things that happened along the way. The dissolution, Heather really, really, the dissolution of the South Bay Union High School District and the closure of Aviation High School. Uh, oh, got those things. The 70, oh, got to the 75th anniversary of the city. Uh, the, uh, well, I was going to say that the Aviation High School. You see now there are the Redondo uh, Performing Arts Center. And that began life as the auditorium at Aviation High School. <coughs> And it's, you know, if you look at it, now, okay, it's nice, we've got a track, we got all that stuff there. Anyway, then we had uh, uh, the removal of the railroad, that's Aviation High School, and over in that corner is the, where the auditorium was. Beautiful high school, but gone. Uh, and then we have, we have the removal of the railroad track yet? Yeah. Yeah, up there. <laughs> and I thought this was great. Steve came up with the present day one. We have the old ones which are tearing up, and you know they went down between Valley and Northmore. Um, and then we have the development of the Metlox property. And again, if you just see this lovely shopping center downtown, maybe you're not aware that that used to, they used to manufacture pottery in there. And it was really quite a few years after they closed down before anything happened because they, they had to clean up all the lead out of that pit. And at one point, my huge hole in the ground. My son said, gee, what are they going to do then? I said, well, I think it's already excavated for the underground parking, so that was, I made that easy on it. Uh, and did you know that the first hometown fair was uh, uh, originated in October of 1973 to, I'm still on, okay, that's a beautiful center now. Uh, now, I forgot to tell you this one. <laughs> now, this is where we just are, isn't it? We uh, uh, see if again said, oh, we had paramedics ready. And I said, well, no, I know they, they started the hometown fair to raise money for a paramedic vehicle. Well, there, there's the paramedics. And when they needed to take these stumps, they borrowed a hearse from the local mortuary. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'd be kind of shaken up if they came to get me in the hearse. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm sure there's lots, lots more things that have gone on here that you know and I don't know or we've all forgotten or whatever. But it was uh, fun to share it with you and thank you, James, for inviting me to do that and also for your efforts to keep the history of Manhattan Beach. And to Steve, of course, for gathering all these pictures and Heather's help too and putting it all together. And of course, I thank Jan Dennis profusely <coughs> for her generosity in sharing her research. And uh, I thank the, the Historical Society for continuing their work. History is now. All the stuff we think was then, but it was once now, and this is now, and will be history later, too. So thank you all. Thanks.